Um, this is Nick. Every note, so he's going to uh, talk about formal mapping and uh, some other stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about like uh, normal mapping, uh, like game art creation uh, for, for things like AAA games and soon to be mobile uh, because if you look at you know mobile games and uh, you know where that's headed, uh, it's you know Infinity Blade already looks like it can be put on the Xbox, so <laughs> you know it, it's it's all going to go there eventually. So get used to these because you're going to be seeing a lot of them. It's the normal map, I mean. So, <laughs> and get used to this color. So uh, has anybody like has anybody ever not seen these colors before? <laughs> color to what? Yeah. Color to what? This this screen here. This this should be a very familiar thing to do. Yeah, this this uh, this great great uh, aqua blue teal. It's more mess. like aqua blue with stuff like purple. Right. And white maybe or green. Does anybody know what these colors mean? Anybody? Coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> Instructor back there. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Students? Yeah. Anybody? Like reflect. Yeah. Come on now. Come you be. No? You guys no? aren't paying attention. No? Okay. No. I haven't done the class yet. <laughs> the X, the XYZ, uh, All right. That's closer. Here we go. These colors mean angles. This blue color means it's flat. That's why you see it everywhere. These each one of the sort of bells on the letter here, aside from the black outline, I just put that there so you can actually read it. <laughs> but it, each one of these colors represents a direction. And you can see that it, what, what, what it is always very confusing about normal maps is this actually looks like it's going in. So it looks like these letter, letters are beveled in. And because that, because this is um, this is so bright, that's the green color down here. It looks like it's being lit from this direction, and it's going in. But actually, you, when you look at a normal map, you need to think about it as being lit from the underside, and now everything reads as it's coming out at you. So um, normal maps have kind of been around uh, now for. 10 years, uh, but they're, they're one of the, the most intimidating and strange parts of game art in general. Um, they, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, it's simply just a bump map that, that is giving you detailed information, you know, coming off the surface, uh, but because it uses these, these colors, uh, you can get a lot better uh, sort of light direction and, and the, the, the way that the light plays on the surface uh, uh, reads reads a lot um, a lot smoother than a black and white image which with black and white you you can only you only have 255 values to to generate smoothness so if you basically want something to to be very sharp, you only have two or three pixels to do that sharpness in. Therefore, it's going to stair step up towards you. So these, you know, smart guys, I, I'm not one. <laughs> these smart guys invented uh, the, uh, the, norm, the normal map, basically using colors to determine what angle the normal of the surface is. Uh, does anybody know what the nor what a normal of what a normal is? They hear that all the time. It's the direction. When you say up, away from here. It's the direction yeah. tangent to yeah. the surface. There you go. So yeah. normals. <laughs> thank you. Look like this. <laughs> so you can see that the sphere here looks really hairy and all those little blue uh, lines coming off uh, are, are representing where the normals actually are and you can see a cylinder has these little L-shaped lines up here at the top and what this is saying is 
this surface is facing up and these surfaces are facing out. And then there's a nice hard edge where those normals break up. Uh, now to most artists, they, they simply just know these as smoothing groups or the smoothing of the, of the model itself. But what a normal map is doing is taking that normal, let's say just one of these normals on this sphere, and, um, and then changing its direction based on those colors. So let's look at those colors again. So the blue color, which if you look at the projectors over there, that's a little better representation of the color. This one looks a little more blue to me. But that, that kind of nice, uh, I don't know, lavender sort of, it's, uh, it's kind of calming, you know, when you start staring at it for a while. As many of them as I do, you know, <laughs> sort of his home. Start, start wanting to put it on the walls a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so you know, it, it's um, so so that 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 means that the normal is flat. But if I were to apply this normal map to a sphere, my text here would read as bumping out at you, and it would be dynamic and look like this really cool high poly game object thing. So for those of you who haven't messed with normal maps or uh, or any of this stuff, I just wanted to explain very very basically kind of what it's doing, um, you know, why why they are around <laughs> right now, um, and they're they're not going away. Uh, they they really aren't. Um, it, so it's one of those things that in in art it, it's a it's a intimidating technical uh, hurdle. To, to, to understand it. And honestly, uh, anybody that tells you they're an expert at them uh, is completely lying. Because they're, I've worked with, with them now since before, like, I was, I've been in the game industry now for, um, for 10 years. Uh, I, I, I worked at uh, Ritual Entertainment with, with Squirrel and, uh, and Chris, corrupt. And um, after a ritual, I went to Nerve Software. Um, and uh, currently, I am with a company called Soap Creative. Uh, at Soap, we actually do um, uh, mobile games. Uh, but, uh, but with the mobile trend uh, and the indie trend, normal maps are, are already making their way into those small titles. So whether or not you want to make an indie an indie game or a AAA game, they're going to be around, and and um, their people are just going to start expecting them. Uh, they're not always used for uh, things like a, a, a really bumpy, gritty Call of Duty type surface. Um, they they can also generate a smoother surface on things. So you can take something like uh, a sphere that has um, millions of polys, and then a sphere that has only a hundred polys. And you can transfer the smoothness from the million poly sphere to the, to the normals of the very jagged kind of sphere. And so you, you give the illusion that that surface is much smoother than um, what it really is. Uh, so I have uh, worked on uh, quite a few titles of varying uh, styles and and um, styles and, and and platforms and and uh, timelines, budgets. Um, but uh, more most recently, you know, I, I worked on um, Call of Duty Black Ops, Black Ops 2, and Aliens: Colonial Marines. Um, those all would not be the games they are today without normal maps. Uh, instead, they would look like Counter-Strike, or Elite Force 2, or Black Hawk Down, or any of these PlayStation 2 games. Because PlayStation 2 didn't even have the capabilities of normal maps. But Doom, you know, Doom 3, and um, I think uh, uh, Chronicles of Rick for the Xbox, uh, those were the, the two really flagship titles 
that came out around 2004 that, that everybody said, hold on, we need to make all games like this because these look like movies. And now, now there's, there's a very blurry line between games and movies now, at least with the art quality. And, and there's starting to be a very blurry line between uh, how many people it takes to make one of those games, uh, how much money it takes to make one of those games, and, uh, and you're actually starting to see a lot of studios um, are, well, one, it, because of a game like Call of Duty, um, the, if you're making a real world, real world game, you have uh, about five or six times the amount of assets to create than you would if you were making, say, a, uh, a cartoony or a, um, a fantasy world. Because in the fantasy world, you can say, okay, I can use this, um, this pillar here for tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of surfaces. But I can't use a mouse on a wall. I can't use a keyboard or a TV or I can't use that for an abstract surface uh, like I could if it was a fantasy object. It's just I'm making a little bit of detail uh, and I can put that detail. If everything's made of stone, like in a castle, well, that stone work can pretty much go anywhere where it fits in the value of where that is. So with realistic games, unfortunately, we know what realism looks like. <laughs> so it's really hard for, for artists to fake it. So what, it, what that means is the asset creation, like the, the amount of asset creation is, is um, just exponentially uh, longer and, and um, takes much, much more people. Um, and so, so with movie, movie titles and, and um, well, the way that movie studios work is they, they have this, this small production, they have a, a production house, and then they farm out their effects, and they farm out, they go to a prop house to buy all of their props or rent all of their props. They go to a costume shop to, to grab some of their costumes, and, and then they have, then they take what they, they have from their collection, and then they start, you know, trying to, com comprise a, you know, a scene out of it. Uh, games are honestly, I think, heading in that direction. Uh, it, it takes so much and so many, so many pieces to make a scene uh, that, that you need to farm those things out because your studio doesn't have enough people uh, to do that. So you're seeing a lot more small studios uh, that say, oh, hey, we can take care of this aspect of your game for you, or, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, motion capture studios are popping up where the, all they do is you know they they get um they contract with these companies and then they uh you know, that's that's all they do they do they do motion capture they clean up motion capture those, those guys still need animators there at the motion capture studio they still need uh modelers there to understand uh the concepts of of things that um you know all of these small studios still require um still require all of those different roles in order to, uh, to understand it. So you're seeing a lot more of, of those kind of places, just like effects houses are today. If you see, if, you, if anybody's ever sat through the credits of any game from, I don't know, here, <laughs> uh, I, I applaud you if you <laughs> have done that, because it's like sitting in the credits in the movie. You want. If you're going to sit through those credits, you want a, a show or something because you're you're going to be sitting there for a really really long time. Uh, and there's a lot of logos that aren't at the front of the movie or the game uh, that that played a really big part in in making that game. Uh, the, my previous company I was with, what Nerve Software, was was one of those companies. Um, we didn't have our name on the front of the box, Call of Duty, but uh, I. I think that in Black Ops 2, we probably made 25% uh, of the art in Black Ops 2 with a art team of um, about seven, seven or eight environment artists. So uh, 
because of that, we, we have uh, a lot of we have a lot of of, of talent uh, and talented guys that that really try to understand what it takes to make something faster. Uh, because there there are there are sort of ideal ways. You have, you have kind of two ends of the spectrum. There are, are ideal ways to make things uh, that would look the best, but it would take X amount of time. Like if you were to make a character, uh, uh, let's say a, a character model is, is probably the thing that takes the longest in terms of just a, a single piece to make. Uh, a character um, in any one of these recent games would take you uh, about two weeks if you're really, really good at it. That's, that's a established, like, uh, experienced artist that has been doing this for years. It takes them about two weeks. The reason it takes them two weeks is because you have to model the character, like a base, a base of the character, a, a kind of low, low polygon version of the character, and then you bring that into something like a sculpting package like ZBrush or Mudbox or any of these things, and then you work for hours and hours and hours sculpting this thing, creating pieces for it. You can't sculpt everything because the software is not quite there yet, so you you have to go back and forth between other packages to, to model little high poly uh, things, the hard surface, uh, armor, um, anything that, that is, is attached to the character. Um, and then you're going back into, you might bring those pieces back into ZBrush and you might sculpt on those for a while. And then finally, after maybe a week or week and a half, you have this gorgeous looking 13 million poly <laughs> sculpture <laughs> that doesn't even have a texture on it yet. <laughs> Um, what, what used to happen is, back, actually when I, when I first started in the game industry, um, the, the best artist on the team was the texture artist. Because the texture artist had to know about light and shadow, and uh, be really, really good uh, at illustration. Um, they would actually be a better illustrator than our concept artist on the team would be, because Every single face, every single um, outfit, uh, vehicles, anything like that, it all had to be hand painted basically in Photoshop. And um, you know, even Photoshop has evolved quite a bit in, in 10 years, even though it doesn't look like it has. <laughs> but actually, there's a lot of little tools that just uh, they're they're slow with the with the features, but but they uh, a lot of times they get it right with with the new feature, and um, you know it it, it pays off. Um, but now nowadays, your best artist is a, more of a sculptor than a painter, uh, because we have a lot of tools now that help you uh, sort of generate the light and shadow for your your completed model. Um, by using this sculpture that you've spent so many hours on. So even though the this, this sculpture took you know, a, a week and a half to make, now that you've gotten to that point, you can use all that geometry to render shadows, render highlights, um, and, and basically what that does is, is outlines <coughs> everywhere where you need to sort of paint, uh, everywhere uh, that, that that needs to pop off that character or that vehicle or that gun. Um, and so, so uh, those tools didn't exist back then because there was, wasn't really much of a need for it. Uh, now you have a lot of, of uh, normal map, uh, well, I should kind of backtrack a little bit, but what, what you're doing with, with that sculpt is you're generating a normal map that can then be, be looked at by all of these other, uh, these other tools to generate um, the, the shadows, the, the, the highlights, and things like that. So um, that's why normal maps are so important, because they're taking the information that you have spent weeks on, and, and 
every bit of that information is now held in this fuchsia looking thing uh, that didn't look anything like the original art that you made. Um, so uh, I just I want to I want to go through sort of you know what it what it really takes. Uh, I want I want to talk about um, a, a few kind of practical ways to to look at these colors uh, to show you that that um, that maybe sometimes you can skip that high poly process uh, with the right with the right assets to make your job a little faster. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to get started here. Um, so, so one of the ways you can create a normal map is uh, by simply hand painting it. Uh, how many of you have attempted to hand paint a normal map? One, two, three, four. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you tried to attempt to do that because. Um, I successfully did it one time. Uh, it, it, it's it's definitely it's not an intuitive thing to do uh, because you have this rainbow colored palette and you can see up here in my um, top uh, left corner here that this is this is a, a sphere uh, that I have you know projected and then that gives me a perfect little palette of normals so that this tells me this actually this sphere is is flattened a little bit to give me a little more, uh, a, a few more colors in the center so that I have some more subtle colors to choose from instead of just a tiny swatch of, of the, the flatter colors on the top of the sphere. So, um, so basically, to hand paint a normal map, you can say, all right, well, I want to make something that is, um, let's see, let's start with something very simple. Let's say, I want to make a, a uh, just a, a simple frame for something, or a, sim a simple, like a window frame. Um, so for a window frame, I'm going to need, let's see, one edge over here so that the light hits this. That would be something like that. And I'm going to fill that. Alt. There we go. So, so now I've put this color on the sphere, on this line here, on this little bit, and then I'll put this color on another line on this side. Like so. Now, what that that's like a bar now that's coming out at us if I want it to go in I simply reverse it by moving the pink side to the left of, of the green side I hate these colors because they're not the, these colors are are these colors because of um, they, they fall into a numeric range on your color sliders so this this fuchsia blue here looks this way because it is actually, they're actually channels. And if you look at, who, who's ever looked at the channels in Photoshop? Anybody? All right, you know what I'm talking about? All right, so you can see that my blue channel here, let me go and click on it, is white. Um, it, you see that should be, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's completely white. And then my green channel, is 128 gray, and then my red channel is 128 gray, except what's really interesting is when I go to my green channel, notice that those lines are barely visible on my green channel. The only reason they're visible at all is because I'm using a sphere to pull colors from. If I had found that exact color uh, over here on my sphere, and then apply that, they would be completely invisible. Because the red channel controls the left and right, and the green channel controls the up and down. So if I'm in my green channel, and I say, all right, well, I want a, I want a bar that goes up and down, or a, a basically a horizontal bar. Um, so if I 
fill my green <coughs> channel. Yeah. Of course, it's going to be annoying. Yeah, yeah not that one. <laughs> All right. All right. It's going to be annoying now. Uh, I don't think you can fill in the channel. I was doing it last night. Oh. Something. Uh, you have the eyeball and the channel on? Yeah. Yeah. You got the channel selected. You got the selection. Yeah. Huh. You'll be able to fill it. I don't know why it's locked. I think you have to select the layer. You got everything. All right. You should fill well, it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, that's what I was doing. Which shot's a great building. Gradient. <laughs> What's this? Uh, oh, it's a layer. It's a different layer. <laughs> <laughs> layers oh, first. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you all that know the joke. <laughs> Paying attention. Yay. Bonus points. And it's What's going on? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. This is a wrap. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> um, so you can notice that it, it, the the red channel is is black and white and gray. Um, it, it's not 100% black over here, and it's not 100% white over here, but it's somewhere in between. Actually, no. I'm sorry. It is 100% black and white in the red channel, but in the blue channel. You can see that there's also a little line of gray there, and that gray value actually controls the amount of, of angle that you're getting. So if I were to, nothing is letting me do anything with my channels right now, but we will try anyways. Yay! All right, so if I darken my blue channel, and I go back and look at my, <laughs> Right, you see that the colors are much different. What, it, what it's actually doing is it's sharpening the angle of that, of that line. So it's making it appear like it's coming out at you even further, even though that line width hasn't changed. So I, I just wanted to kind of, kind of touch on that because you can use channels uh, to sort of understand neural maps. You can also kind of work in channels a little bit to um, to refine them or to to see uh, things that that maybe uh, you generated in one program but you can't um, and you can't quite quite do in, in another. Um, so a practical use for so I said like like I said it, it's not it's not wise to hand paint and all that but but it's it's good to understand what they're doing, and it's good to understand what the channels actually do. Um, but there are some practical uses for hand painting normal maps, and the reason I have a little sphere up here, aside from having a palette, um, is I've shaped the sphere kind of flat so that I can um, pick from, from sort of the center of the sphere. And what I'm going to make something like that. So broken glass um, is one of those things that you see a lot in games, uh, mainly because uh, windows are usually <coughs> not transparent, because if you made transparent windows everywhere, uh, then uh, you would uh, you basically see into every single building, and you could have no studio facades like you know you need to fake you need to fake windows basically everywhere because uh, you don't have the, the poly count to, to make an inside for every single building um, so you so you know you have a lot of mirrored finishes and things like that for, for windows but it's it's kind of uninteresting to always look at those mirrored finishes so if you have a normal map that uh, like your, your building is a derelict or um, you know abandoned or whatever uh, you can you can generate um, just sh blocks of shape and fill those with normal colors and eventually end up with something like this which is 
literally me in about 20 seconds taking taking little eyedropper selections and then going to my sphere about where I'm where you know kind of relative to this place here this um, the space here I'm picking you know a color here and then filling a shape here so and then I kind of go over here and I pick a color here and I fill that there so I make a selection with my with my eyedropper or with my with my um, lasso and then I use my eyedropper grab something that's kind of in that area and I fill it and you can see that now that is a slightly different blue than this one and it's a little bit lighter than this one and the end result is something like this So now I have applied that normal map onto this plane, and you can see that the light looks like it's fractured. So in a, in a few, you know, in a, about a minute, you can make a broken window pane that you can, you know, place inside of, of your window. Um, so so that's pretty neat. Uh, you know, there, 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 are, there are practical applications uh, for it, um, uh, but that still doesn't make me a character or a, uh, a vehicle or, or something complicated. Uh, so you usually need to project your details to normal maps that you create in a 3D, you know, 3D application. I actually use Max. Uh, I know most of you guys don't use Max. Uh, so I'm not really going to go into technical uh, technique of what what I'm pressing pressing where. I'm not going to give you a, a max uh, lesson, um, but uh, but it does have a few things uh, that some of the other software packages don't. Um, it it has a a, vis a visible projection cage. Um, that that tells you what you what geometry you are projecting to. Uh, so it can actually this you basically have a unhide this. Well, I'm talking about normal maps in general, modeling for normal maps. And I'll I'll show you what the cage means in a second. All right, so this is my my. Biggest, most valuable tip I can give you for modeling for a normal map. This is your face normal. Normal maps don't see depth as you think of depth. They see angles. So if it can't see angles, it can't see your depth. <laughs> and I hear a couple of groans in the audience. Professional game artists that are getting paid to do this don't understand this concept yet. It, it's, it's something that you don't think about when you're modeling because you're, you're modeling at various angles like this. You're always seeing these things in, <laughs> it's good, it's good. It, means you, it means you just learned something. <laughs> you're always seeing these things in three quarter views and you're always rolling around your shapes and, and, you're, and you're, you're seeing that, oh, well I have a, a, a very complicated surface coming off of this surface, so obviously my normal map's gonna, gonna pick that up, but it doesn't because it's coming off of this surface. You see that when I, go into my top view and I look down at the sphere that two of those shapes just completely disappeared. It doesn't matter how many shapes you have, how cluttered your surface is, if they're all just simply coming off of that surface at 90 degree angles, you will never, ever, 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 ever see them. So 
you have to always think about those things, like buttons, um, small, small details, trims, anything you're putting onto a surface to give it detail, you have to have angles with it. And the one at the top there is also not correct. Like that is also not a way to do it because you see that the sides of it actually have a large <coughs> amount of depth to it. Um, it's coming off the surface quite a bit, but the only thing you're seeing is this little trim on here and it looks very flat and very shallow to the surface. So these other two shapes are sort of the ideal way to, to represent the same sort of depth coming off of a normal map because they sort of have a, a sense that even though they're trapezoids they give you a sense that this thing is fairly deep and and coming out at you like you expect it to come out at you um, so so with modeling normal maps everything has to be a uh, uh, you know, kind of angled uh, m m more than a 90 degree angle, like angled in. Uh, you have a question? Uh, oh, well then why can't you just do little drawings like that, like do maybe different colors instead of that, because as I, as far as I see it, they match, match like colors, so maybe you should probably draw, draw in some lines or something to make it more visible too, just in case. Um, the, yeah, that's that's a, that's kind of like a further step in the process. When you when you have a normal map that is that is generated, um, you can use that normal map to then create uh, lines and outlines and shadows and highlights on things uh, to further uh, simulate the depth. But but this this depth can be generated from this flat surface. So if I select this plane that I've got here, awesome. Oh, I got uh, So if I select this plane here and put a Projection on it. Sorry, I don't have any of my setup with me. So, <coughs> I have to do things a long way. And I pick all of this, all of these high poly objects here. And this is the cage that I was talking about earlier. You see this little blue line around around the outside of the, uh, I don't think you guys can see that. It's kind of a blue line there. Um, that is the representing the poly that right now it's only one or one poly, two tries uh, of, of this, um, of this sh surface. So if I push my cage up, you can see that that is now rising above this this plane and I can turn this kind of shaded thing on so I can see immediately when it sort of passes through <coughs> this high poly geometry so pretend this is your zebra sculpt or this is your uh, your your vehicle or uh, something like that and now you have encompassed all of the detail that you've spent weeks modeling on top of your um, on top of your character so uh, what's really nice is you have a really nice visual representation of where you are uh, on that. And uh, I don't think Maya has, uh, ha has this function yet. I think they still use um, just numbers. If, if, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I think, I think that it's just a value that you, that you set with your projection in Maya. You can use a cage in XNormal too. Okay, yeah, XNormal has a cage as well, that's right. Uh, back, back there. And, uh, when, when you were doing the top-down view, you could only see a little bit of that rounded square. Uh -huh. <coughs> you can't really see the depth of it. Is, the fact that a normal map doesn't capture the depth, depth is that 
a technical issue with the way you render a 3D model to a normal map? Or is that a limitation of normal maps in general? Because couldn't you go in and hand paint a redder box over to make it appear to have more depth since red controls how far it comes up off? Um, no, see red does not control how far it comes off. Nothing, nothing is actually controlling how far something pushes out at you. It's only controlling angles. So, so the the uh, let me see. What, go back here. Ah, not that. How many on time, Chris? Uh, I've got about like 15 minutes or so. Yeah, we start. Let's try to save our questions until the yeah. end. Yeah. Let me let me move on light. so I can show you some more some actual cool stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's. The surfaces that are, that are, go back to my page one here. This, this surface here is the same color as this surface here. But when you read, but because of the way the light hits these normals here, it gives you the illusion that it's coming out at you. Because this catches light before this catches light. And then this, has shadow, and and basically as you move as you move that surface around, the light changes on these surfaces, not the top surface. So the top of that that cube is always blue, but the sides change different change different based on the angle of of the the thing coming off of the surface. That's why you have to have the sides visible. Or you, you don't see it. That's why. That's why it disappears. It disappears just like it does in the viewport, right on the normal map. And so there's no way to actually change that depth without having the the sides of it be visible. It has no depth. It's not there. Um, and so that's why you don't do things like if if you want something. This is kind of a bad example because these things are really protruding off of this surface. Uh, I think it's, it's better to think about these things as, let's say they're tiny little buttons, like you're modeling a keyboard or something. These are, these are keyboard buttons. Uh, you don't, if you were modeling a keyboard and you were putting this in a game and you wanted it to run in real time, you wouldn't model every single one of these buttons because now your poly count of your tiny little object that's sitting on your desk is through the roof. Your game won't run, especially if you're making a computer lab and you have uh, a whole you know, collection of keyboards in there. Now you're talking about millions of polys for just a single object that is on the screen, on like one quarter of the screen. <laughs> you know, if that, if you go up there and look at it and look down at the keyboard and you can read the letters, you're only taking up about one quarter of your HD TV resolution. So, kind of think about that when you're making texture map sizes, when you're when you're making geometry details. Um, make geometry details that 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 kind of um, be aware of how small your details are. You know, if you make a detail too small, and then your texture map size is only uh, 1024 or 512, 512 is 512 pixels. <laughs> you know, or, across and down. So if you have a bolt that is this tiny, tiny little thing on your, on your texture, you just lost that bolt in a pixel. So you need to think about your details as being, if you're working with knowing what I told you before, is the, the only way to have depth is to have sides. Well, the only way to have sides is to have pixels for those sides. So if you make something too small, you can't see those sides anymore because now it's a blurry mess, like it's only two or three pixels, and you only have a single pixel for the sides of your object. So a bolt, for example, in order to be seen as a bolt, needs at least five or six pixels. So if you scale that thing super, super tiny, and then you make your, your, your map, you know, you know, the size that it needs to be, you're going to lose all those details that you just spent weeks making. Uh, so, so it's something to keep in mind when you're, you know, when you're actually modeling this stuff for that for that high poly 
um, those high poly things. Um, so I'm just going to render this really quick. So you saw that it rendered and it gave me a really quick, let's do that again so you can see it. What did I render? I just made a, good job, I made a white square. <laughs> so, it doesn't look like anything. Uh, what I actually made was a normal map. Um, I saved it in here. So let me do this. Oh wait, time. I'm going too fast. I'm going too fast, my own good. Try again. Yay, there's something. Now it's red and has my squares on it. Um, so so what, it's, what it's looking at is it's looking at my high poly geometry. And I want it to also look at my low poly geometry. So I'm going to tell you to use my working model. And we're into that. There we go. So now it looks exactly what our top, like exactly what our top viewport looks like. Um, this obviously is not a normal map. It's not blue and white. This is actually a render of my my scene. That's why it looks almost I identical to what I'm looking at here. Um, but what it did for me is it generated a normal map that I can now apply to this plane. Sorry, I work with like three monitors. <laughs> so uh, doing this is a little difficult. It's going to be a little messy for a second. Texture. I want that as a normal map, so I'm going to put it on my bump. This is a normal bump. So, make it 100%, and turn it on in real time. All right, sorry. So now you can see the normal map's representation of that geometry. You can see that these two squares here look very deep, like they're coming off the surface. And then that the one up here looks very shallow because it's not looking at any of those, those sides. It's only looking at what was angled, which was only the top of the sphere. Think about it like a marshmallow. You know that you can only see as soon as as soon as it uh, as soon as that 90 degree angle turns to anything less than 90, then, or, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> it, as soon as it's anywhere not 90, it, you, you start seeing that surface in the normal map. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, so, so let me move on here and show you some, some little techniques, uh, hopefully quickly, um, that uh, I use to cut my time in half. Uh, oh, this is another example here of just that even at, even with a cylinder, each face has a normal. So you can see that I kind of lose this shape here. I kind of this thing here, even though it's sticking out that way, has no sides to it. So it is basically going to read exactly like the cylinder would read. This thing, however, has two nicely beveled sides to it. So it's going to catch light here, and it's going to catch 
you know, a color here, and then this is still going to be blue. These guys are all going to be blue in the middle. Blue, blue, doesn't matter how many of them are. They're all going to be that same color as, as, if, as if they were just flat against that surface right here in the middle. So each one of these angles will pick up the same colors all the way around there because they're all based off the same kind of normals off of this cylinder. Remember when I showed you this, this the normal with the normals off the cylinder, they all radiate out away from the polys. So they so so those normals are basically facing in the exact same direction as these little gears here. So that's just you know something a little more complicated than plane, uh, but works exactly the same way. So this is <laughs> this is something that I do uh, quite a bit. Uh, it, it's called kit bashing. The, the word actually comes from uh, plastic models. Anybody play with plastic models when they were a kid? Build plastic models? You ever, you ever have like two plastic model kits and you're like, man, I really like the tires on this car and I want to put them on this car, or the wheels or the headlights or, you know, it just, it, it, if you wanted to melt some plastic and put, fuse some parts together, you could. You had, you had some place to start. Um, that's where the term comes from. You're, you're taking parts from other model kits and you're putting it, you're, you're adding it to a, another kit that looks completely different. Um, ILM uh, was kind of one of the pioneers of this uh, in, the, in the effects industry uh, when they made Star Wars. Uh, the, the Star Destroyers and the Death Star and, and everything, Millennium Falcon, all that stuff is made of model kits that you can go buy in the store or they could go buy in the store in 1977 and, and you know, pull off parts and then glue them to another surface. And, you know, they, so that whole, the whole Death Star is just made of, you know, made of motorcycle parts. <laughs> you know, if you think about it that way. Um, so people in, in, in 3D modeling use this a lot now because it takes forever to model this stuff. So, so here's a, a various collection of screws um, that people, like professional artists, have made uh, that I looked at and was like, I don't like how that one looks. This one could be better. This one could be better. And you can see that if I go to my top view here, can you see? Let's see from here. <laughs> let's, let's pretend our viewport here is a panel and we have rivets on that panel. Can you guys point out which rivets you can actually see the details in? I mean, the cross ones. Yeah, basically, these three here, these Phillips, these Phillips ones right here, are the only ones that even have any remote kind of detail. And then these guys that kind of divot in a little bit, that you can kind of read those pretty well from a distance. I made these two like a couple of weeks ago because I was tired of looking at the stuff here and noticing how shallow all my details were. So I sat there and looked at a screw head <laughs> and said, okay, why, why is my screw head, you know, not, not look at this Phillips head, you know, not look like a real Phillips head. And then I said, okay, what can I do to make it read like a Phillips head screwdriver in a normal map? And so, you know, I changed some angles on it. I said, I said, I'm never gonna have a flat surface when looking down in this hole. I'm just gonna angle it the entire way, all the way to a point, so that it looks very deep and dark, and, and the light never kind of gets in there. And, um, and of course, you, you, you add some shadowing and stuff in your diffuse map to that, and now it reads exactly like you think it should. You'll notice that I also have a lot of things on here that go in. These are what I call floaties. Um, one of the great things about no modeling for normal maps is because of these normals, because of this concept, that you can only see you you can only see angles. So when when you're looking down at a normal map and you see something caving in, that's what the normal map's going to see. It doesn't matter where on the surface that object is placed. If it looks like it's caving in, it's going to cave in. Which, if you think about, if any of you have done really high poly uh, hard surface modeling, you'll know that your edge flow is one of the biggest um, 
one of the things that, that's the hardest to wrap your head around when you're modeling a surface. So if you're modeling a surface, let's say it's a giant spaceship and it's super smooth and now you want a bunch of panels and rivets and scoops and things that a jet fighter would normally have on that surface. Well, you can take things like this, um, this countersunk or uh, dug-in screw right here and you can just put this directly on top of your nice, easy, smooth surface and it will read like it's going in. And just to give you a little example, this whole thing here, that's just a, that's just a plane, single plane down there. And you can see that many of these details look like they're going into the surface. They're not. They're all floating on top and they're all objects that I can just pull apart and move wherever I want to, rotate them around, and they don't read any differently. That's all. That's because basically the edges of these things are flat and they just read flat, flatly into the normal map. This, this technique was, was uh, I, didn't, I didn't invent it. Uh, <laughs> Doom, Doom 3 and, and the artist that it, it invented this when they were trying to figure out what the hell a normal map was. And we started looking at their, um, we were privileged to look at their source material when we were ritual and we, our, our minds were blown because we're like, oh, they're not cutting everything into the surface and taking a million hours to do this stuff. They're just plopping all this stuff down on top of this and it reads like a beautiful sculpted thing. This, this, was, kind of, this was before ZBrush. This was before, this is when everybody was, uh, they were sculpting these models by hand in, in Maps or Lightwave or Maya or whatever they were using, and um, and yeah, it was just it, it was it was kind of awe-inspiring uh, when you think about it uh, that they didn't have a sculpting program uh, to make all that stuff. Uh, they were just tweaking every little every little point, um, and so you can see that you can take your your sort of zoo here. This is what I call it, a little prop zoo or a, um, a normal zoo. And you can make all sorts of things, um, complicated things that you would normally see, uh, you know, in household items or characters or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know how many times I want a snap lock on my character, but I just found out, found that I was always wanting a snap lock. You know, those little the little backpack snap locks that are that everybody has. Um, I wanted them on everything. Everything tactical had to have some kind of snap lock or or eyelet or loop or something. Uh, to look really cool. So I don't want to make that again. I just want to make one and then I'm going to apply that, put that snap lock wherever I want on the straps. Because the straps are easy to make. Straps are just, you know, a single surface kind of, you know, laying on top of another surface. So it's, it's the snap locks that take, take the time and they're the things that actually make the straps read like straps because they have the things that you expect straps to have. If you just put a little strap on there, and it's, it doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a little ridge on there. But if you, if you take the time to put the buckles and put the little things that you, that you normally see when you're looking at, at a human person like walking in the hallway, you're like, you see a million things on them that you don't even pay attention to. All these little buckles, laces, and, and all this, these things that go into fashion design um, that you, you take for granted, you, you sort of forget about when you're making a character or modeling something. Uh, so, uh, what's up? Hey man, uh, yeah. we're kind of running out of time. If you want to show maybe like one, one more like kind of key thing. Sure. Um, so, so using this concept and the concepts I showed you there, I turned this very, very, very basic <laughs> thing into Actually, this is a different concept. I'm going to show it really quick, really quick, because that's why I download Crazy Bone. Okay, so... <laughs> Alright, here we go. So, the other, the other thing, the other way to create normal maps is from, from photos, height maps, or um, photos and height maps, basically, with these various programs, um, which I'll cover a little more, maybe in the questions, <laughs> but this. Anybody use any of these? 
One, two, three, four, five. It's good. If you're an artist, you should be using one of these programs. I know they, they, they may not feel like they are um, like the primary program, but you throw Crazy Bump or Indu or Didu or MindText, which is a very, um, a very in, inexpensive version of some of these things. Uh, it doesn't do as many things, but it is fairly cheap for $15. Uh, and then Indu, the original Indu is actually free, so um, look it up, <laughs> take a picture or, or whatever. Um, but you know what these do is they generate they, they generate normal maps from photos and from height maps. They also generate specular maps and ambient occlusion maps based on your normal maps. So I use them more for that than I do for actually generating. Uh, normal maps from the from photos. Uh, photos are great when you want something gritty, or you want something um, uh, you know very. Uh, they they just don't read. They just don't read like you think they're going to read uh, with these generation programs. If if you have river rock, it's easier for you to make a bunch of stones. Uh, because they're just basically smooth spheres that are kind of blobby, and place those stones down um, in, in, in a modeling package, and then go ahead and just quickly project it when it's, you know, if it's just a single texture, um, it, it, it's it's going to read a lot better than trying to take river rock and then generate a normal map from that, from one of these programs. Uh, and you're going to have a little more control because you can move those stones around wherever you want and make as many configurations as you want when they're objects to, to move around. Um, but yeah, these are, this is, these are all the student pricing for, for all these programs. Uh, I think I think Didu and Indu run about like maybe maybe as high as 300, but I want to say it's less than that, maybe 200, 250. 150, 150. For individual price for each yeah. commercial. So, but but in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, 3D Studio Max and Maya and Photoshop, uh, all of those programs are way cheaper <laughs> than, than what these do. And, and honestly, they're going to cut your time in half uh, when it comes to making something. So uh, definitely check them out. They all have, they all have free trials. And, and um, you know, like I said, Indu is, Indu is completely free, uh, the original one. But uh, Indu 2 is really cool. Um, and it basically just works in Photoshop and, and generates things. But I've, I've used Crazy Bump for a long time, so uh, I'm just going to show you really, really quick um, how I use Crazy Bump, how I used Crazy Bump for Call of Duty um, assets uh, to make high poly assets, make game art assets without making high poly assets very quickly. Um, so, so one of the things that I, I did, I did is, in, it's it's about how you UV something. So when you unwrap something, um, when you separate smoothing groups, this is just as general rule of thumb. Write this down if you want to. When you separate smoothing groups in your low poly, separate your UV islands. If you don't know what I mean by a UV island, what I mean is when you look at a UV, at your UVs after you've unwrapped this thing, each one of these groups here is a island. So basically, think of it like an element or a, a poly. Uh, what do you call it in, Ma in Maya? A poly surface, a completed poly surface. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of elements in your UV window, but uh, a lot of programs call them islands or, you know, it's just a general term. Um, so what I did was I UV'd my, my box here. Um, let me see some UVs here, just kind of put a little check back. Just, just kind of uniquely unwrapped this, um, this very simple, I'm just going to call it a generator because everything in a game is a generator. <laughs> Very simple little generator here, and I rendered my template as if I were, as if I wanted guidelines to paint on, like in Photoshop. Except I rendered my template a very specific way. I rendered it shaded, 
um, and without edges. I, I don't know what kind of options you have for your rendering templates in Maya, but I believe you have some options for how it renders templates. Um, so if I render this template, whoa, not shaded, <laughs> solid. So if I render this template, I, I, I made my, I'm gonna make my fill white, and my background color is gonna default to black. You'll see that what I have here <clears throat> is a black and white version of my, um, of my, of my texture. Uh, or, or my UVs. Black and white reads like up and down. So if I go in a crazy bump and grab my height map here, let me expand it and then copy it. If I go in a crazy bump and I paste my height map in, crazy bump just made me a normal map of all of my edges, all of them. So it just outlined every surface that I made a UV island and just gave me edge normals for a box. I spent 20 minutes, 10 minutes making that box. I spent however long, I, you know, if it wasn't explaining the whole process, I'd spend about a few seconds opening up Crazy Bump and clicking a button. And now I have a edge normal box. Let me blow through the rest of these steps here. But So you see what, what you're looking at right here is a normal map on the same box. But you can see that those edges get a little bit of light when I roll around it. Now, I will say in Crazy Bump, there's one thing to, to note, and that's the intensity of what this is. I don't know what the intensity is in, in do, but basically it needs to be about 20% in order for this to work. Um, basically, that's because it's pillowing every surface. So if you drop your intensity, eventually you're going to hit that 45 degree angle that you're trying to hit. So right now you're pillowing both of these surfaces out this way, and it's sort of giving this thing a 45 degree angle and then it's giving this thing a 45 degree angle in. So if you drop your, your intensity, eventually those angles start to merge and become one angle. And that's sort of, 22% was just kind of what I figured out was, you know, that was the sweet spot. And so um, with very little time, you can basically get your edge normals on something. And now all it needs are details. Well, I, I been working on details for 10 years of my career and I have a nice little normal zoo so I'm going to take that and oh the other thing I generate is ambient occlusion uh, I don't have time right now to go over ambient occlusion um, but with max it's like I brought up that render to texture dialogue it's very easy to uh, say I want to add an ambient occlusion to this thing, and then it generates an amb ambient occlusion from the parts of your low poly. So now I'm looking at baked in shadows and the, the highlights from the normal map. So that's, this, that's what you're looking at there. So then I take it a step further, and I take my normal map, and I put it on a plane, just like I'd be painting a texture. And then I take all of those details that I've been working on and all these little screws and I just put them where I want to. It's super easy. I already have all my edges. I just put all these little parts down on this sheet and all I have to do is worry about where the sheet is coming from because I know where these things are. And I see everybody shaking their head like, this is so simple. <laughs> what that gives you is this. So you'll see my fan is inside of my surface. My, my tubes have some nice ridges on them. I have some different types of vents here, some that pop off the surface, some that go into the surface. I've also colored some of these things. Let me go back to my little sheet here. See that I also projected colors because it's a lot easier to colorize polys than it is to 
go into Photoshop and outline everything by hand, which is what everybody starts doing. But if you were to go in there and, and try to take care of these wires here in Photoshop, that would take a good amount of your day when all you need is a color applied to a, applied to a model. Um, so I'm projecting those colors to my diffuse map as well. And then that's what I, what I end up with. And this is, I mean, this is your work. If you're, if you're modeling this thing in high poly, you're spending a lot of time modeling all of these edges and making sure all your edge flow is great and making sure that it's projecting right and the parts aren't hitting each other. And there, there's all these, these kind of complicated things that, that happen whenever you're um, making something mechanical and complicated uh, like, like this. And you can see that I even have some dents in here. Uh, I didn't make them perfectly flat, so you can kind of see the edges of them. But I have some dents going on here. I um, have some, uh, you know, there's my wires that look like they're inside of that surface. You can see the light plays on it, reads inside of there, the fan, the set. And you can see my, go over here to this guy, and you can see all of my, whoa, what is, wow. I don't know what's going on there. You, you clicked on something I can tell. It's my fan. <laughs> Weird. So it's like the edge, the wireframe edges aren't. All right. I can still show you this, but you can see that um, all these things are just floating on top. Even those really deep vents right there, those really dark vents, like they're way above the surface. And I'm just faking it all. And those dents, you can see here's one of the dents right here. Let me select my dent. There's a dent right there. You see it? You see it now? Yeah. Yeah. So there's some dents. That's just a it's just a, a surface that's just floating on top of there. It just happens to be flat like the plane is. And then I'm taking the polys in the middle and saying, I'm going to make you a dent. And there you go, done. I didn't add any geometry to, to, to make it. Uh, I just put a little thing on top of there and treated it just like it's one of these mechanical objects. You know, So you can do that with sculpts and cracks and all sorts of stuff like that as well. So, And let me show you this with a finished texture so you get an idea. So once all that's in place, it's just a projection modifier and maybe maps, and that's yep. it. Yep. Ready to go. Yep. Huh. You have to choose which maps you want to project, um, but uh, come on, baby. Sorry, bear with me for a second. a couple of uh, you know photos that I grabbed off of cgtextures.com. If you haven't discovered this site yet, uh, you need to go to it today <laughs> and take a look at it because it is it is absolutely a lifesaver when it comes to um, text photos and, and texture ref and photo ref. Um, and you know all I'm doing I'm just simply in Photoshop, and of course Photoshop's the fun part. So what's great about this, this technique here is I'm not spending a whole lot of time in Max to, to model all these little bits. Uh, I'm spending most of my time in Photoshop. Uh, in this case, I actually didn't hardly spend any time in Photoshop, yeah. but um, I, I basically take that normal map to generate things like specularity in 
Crazy Bump or Indu or whichever one you're using. So look, there's my, there's my edge normals. If I loaded my other normal map into it, uh, my finished normal map. So it's, it's like, so think about it like I created two normal maps. I created one normal map to give me my edge normals, and then I created sort of a complete normal map that had my edge normals and my little details in max. Um, so it's uh, the finished normal map. So finished normal map gives me, you know, all of my details here. So that's what's on the final the final asset, and then I can take that to now generate amine occlusion. You know, to, to give me all my dark spots and my texture, and I can use my specularity to give me my highlights and my texture. So just knowing basic knowledge of how, um, you know, uh, level, um, level rendering works, you can, you can screen, your, screen your highlights and multiply your darks over your color that you can, you know, just change up. So if I want this thing to be, you know, a different color, of course I can, you know, change the color, um, you know, in there. And um, that's it. So. Everything else is just a grime with the spec map. It's basically, I, I like to start with my diffuse map, and then I go to my spec map, because the spec map is basically using all of the same elements. Uh, let me see if we make these extra large for you guys. Let's see if you can see any of my layers here, but, um, but basically my spec map is just my diffuse map with a much darker kind of base to it. Um, I'm brightening my specular details that I also used in my diffuse map because when light doesn't hit a surface, you still want uh, it's, you still want to treat it like an old school game. You still want to have a little bit of lighting and a little bit of shadow baked in so that when that dynamic light doesn't hit something, like I'm in the dark right now, you don't see anything shining off of me, but yet you can still you can still tell that I'm that I have depth to it. With a game um, if that light is not, um, it's, it's the difference between baked in lighting and your, and your dynamic lighting. So when you're calculating light maps in Unity or whatever, when something just walks into a light map, it's just being sort of colorized to that, to that shape. So, um, so you kind of need this, you need a little bit of information in your diffuse map to, um, to give that thing uh, some depth. So, but I think that's it. So. Uh, Uh, we have any time for questions or? Yeah, we have some time. I, I yeah. have a question actually. Sure. <laughs> How many, it's, it's a two part question, but I'll make it quick. How many pipes have you made in your career? <laughs> and what do you think of shiny bricks? Shiny bricks. Um, uh, you know, there's always a place for shiny bricks. <laughs> you know, if you put an acrylic paint on, sh on bricks, it, they're pretty shiny. Uh, but uh, but of course you know bricks bricks themselves should should be fairly matte. Uh, you, but but unfortunately you know for, for normal maps to really shine they need that dynamic uh, quality of a specular. So that's why artists tend to make bricks a little bit shinier than they than they should be because um, you want to see that normal map. You want to see that gritty those gritty details and pipes. I make pipes every day. So <laughs> but they're just splines. They're, I, I, and Max, I just do a renderable spline, and now I have a pipe. So uh, and do that in Maya as well if you can do that. So, what's up? Real quick. Earlier, you talked about the, the resolutions that these things are rendered in. What are games normally rendered at? Are they rendered at 1024? Are they rendered at 512? You know, this. I think everybody makes a mistake. Oh, you're going to build this perfect thing. It's going to be this yeah. high resolution. And right. I mean, it's always it's always a good practice to um, to model things bigger when you're unsure of what your your game's uh, uh, your game's resolution should be. Okay. Um, however. Okay, like Black Ops yeah. Two. What was that rendered at when it was built? Uh, the. The game? I mean, or you mean you mean just like like what would a wall texture be? Yeah. Like a wall textures were mostly like 512s. Okay. Um, 
the reason the reason the texture size is a little smaller in uh, Black Ops is because uh, there's so many things in the, in the in the environment that. Uh, you, you have to balance it somehow. So with a realistic game, like I was talking about before, you, you, you can't reuse those parts as much as you can reuse something that's all stone. So if you look at something like um, Orcs Must Die, have you played Orcs Must Die? Or, or I, I know familiar of, yeah. with it? Orcs Must Die had, uh, uh, you know, it's made of the whole environment is just castles. Right. Everything made of stone. So they can sort of use all of their stone pieces everywhere, and now they're making a lot fewer pieces, and they're making uh, they can make higher textures because they can they can push push a little bit more on the individual asset as opposed to if you have a, a large collection of assets. I know one of y'all's project is like a is like a mall or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so the problem <laughs> with doing the mall is you have stores that need to look different. You have you have all of these things, these real world things that are even in the stores. If you look around this room, for example, uh, I don't know if you can count how many objects you would have to make if you were to look around this room, but it's it's, it's more fingers and toes than I have, right. uh, and so, we try. you know, <laughs> we try yeah, yeah, if you, if you try to make it, like, really sit down and just say, I want to make a, a room, and, and then start looking around and like, oh my gosh, I have to make that projector, I have to make this stand. I have to make a chair, I have to make a backpack, I have to make another backpack, I have to make another backpack. You know, you start realizing how specific everything is in that room. There's like three t textures of carpet in here, I think, yeah. and then there's there's different wall sections, and then there's different things on each and every wall. Um, you know, so, so you need to start kind of dumbing it down a little bit and say, okay, what's the gist of this room? Is it necessary? There's some columns, there's a wall, you know, there's some desks, there's a chair, uh, and then and then with whatever else you got, you can kind of throw it in there and clutter it up a little bit. Um, but you, you have to pare it down to what are the what are the key assets that you need to make to, to give that feeling. So with the mall, uh, you know, you, you obviously you need some clothes in there. You need uh, some walls and floors and lights and 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 doors and and the basic thing. So it's good to start with sort of. What is the like? What does it look like when you first walk into that room? If you've ever bought a house before, um, and you walked into that house or that apartment for the very first time, and there's nothing in it, like that's what you should start with. Yeah. It's like wall, ceiling, floor, and then fill it in with with whatever else. This also, and this piggybacks on the last question you mentioned earlier: video game production and film production uh -huh. are coming close to par. Yep. Um, when you did the latest Aliens game mm -hmm. and Black Ops 2, mm -hmm. what were their production numbers? I mean, how much did it cost them, for example, Black Ops 2? No. <laughs> they don't tell me those things. Okay. So I, I, don't know if I, just know the, I just know the amount of people that it took to make it. And I, you know, I know what I make. And I would, you know, kind of ballpark what other people make. Uh, so, you know, it takes X millions of dollars to run this studio with this amount of this, these people. So you're talking, you know, but but you look at Call of Duty numbers and how much they've sold and how much they've made. They say, oh, well, we make three billion dollars on this or seven billion dollars. I don't know how many. I, I I can't remember what the last number was, but it was. You know, it was like 17 million copies or or Six something like that. Billion dollars. Huh? How much? 6.9 billion dollars. There you go, 6.9 billion dollars. So you make 6.9 billion dollars on a title and you know you're gonna make maybe even a quarter of that next next time you make one, you can pretty much budget in a few million dollars here and there for... See, that's just it. I mean, it, yeah. it, for example, last year was 200 million to make. Mm -hmm. It only made two billion in the theaters worldwide. Right. Right. So you compare that to the, yeah. that figure you just gave me. Yeah. 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 If I could just barge in yeah. for a second. So I realize now that weird picture you sent us for the poster, that was your normal man. Correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a little more sense when... Yeah. <laughs> you don't have that render, do you? Uh, no, I don't think I brought okay. it with me. Yeah. But that was a generated normal. That was so funny. It's hard to bring nobody's attention. You pull the generator back up. What's that? You pull the generator back up in the monitor. Oh, sure. I just wanted everybody to know. It's kind of hard to fuck. It's kind of hard to see in here. But look at look at this try here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is 398. 398. 398 polys. 
So, and, and this is this is a shippable Call of Duty asset right here. Um, the the reason, uh, actually, you know, boxes are great. Level designers love them. <laughs> you know why? They're a good solid piece of cover. So that's why there's so many boxes and crates and different things like that because they're not they don't interfere with your head. Like if there's tons of stuff on a desk or on a, on a surface. Um, you know, then if I'm taking cover behind this thing, like that monitor sort of masks my head a little bit as I'm moving around. So you want to be able to sort of visibly see the enemies, uh, you know, popping in and out. You know, it's, it's kind of changes with single player, multiplayer. You know, with, with what's acceptable or not. I probably, if I was really make this in a game um, like Call of Duty or something, I'd probably have a couple of little knobs like modeled on there, a little bit pieces that stick out and give it a little bit better silhouette. Silhouette's one thing that, that that people will just keep drilling into your head. Try to make the silhouette of that thing interesting, and then just the details are in the normal map. You know, all of, all of those little bits and bobs are just modeled straight on that surface. Try to make flatter details that you know give it you know the, give it a little depth. Um, you know, so. What are your thoughts on Mario? <laughs> you know, I haven't played around Mario yet. Uh, I, I've honestly just recently sort of. Uh, Kind of learned about it. Yeah. Um, he's had his hand up for a while. What's yeah. um, if you were to make a, a, a novice portfolio for a game environment artist, I mean, what things would you want to focus on? I mean, what kind of scenes do you want to aim for? I've looked around a lot, and you sort of see many people doing outdoor scenes and interior scenes. So usually they have a house or installation or building or landscape, and then they have kind of like a destroyed, dilapidated scene. Yeah. And then one sort of non-standard scene. Yeah. Is there, there, is there anything else you can add to that? Well, I mean, the, the good thing you're saying there is scene. No one's saying so uh, that. Yeah. That a scene is impressive. Uh, when, when, uh, th these days, a prop really just isn't that impressive. Like you can really, you can make a really nice looking toaster or you know old old thing um, that looks cool, and you might have spent a really long time on that thing. But at the end of the day, that backpack, as hard as it is to make, is only this big on the screen. You know, I always try to think about. What type of game am I making? If I'm making a first-person shooter, I'm walking around, and I'm walking around the room, and I'm usually not right up against a wall when I'm walking around a room. So I'm usually not looking down at a desk when I'm walking around the room. I'm just walking in the pathway, or I might kind of take cover and hug the wall. but. If you think about screen resolution, you know, an HD TV right now <laughs> is 1080 by uh, 1270 in resolution. Um, a texture size is 10, you know, 1024, 512, 2048. Well, here's your HD TV right here in the middle of all those things. So if you're making 2048s, you're actually making something that's bigger than your HD TV. So I mean, does that make sense to you? I mean, when when you when you take something, if you put a 2048 on a wall, in order to see the entirety of that resolution, you have to back up. And at that time, it's not even that resolution anymore. So you know, you have to think about sort of <coughs> the distance from the surfaces that you're generally looking at it, and that's how you sort of determine your texture sizes. You know, when something is, the reason characters, for example, have a 2048 is because there's a lot of surface to them, and, it, and it's wrapping around the character, and they tend to be in your face and be in cinematics, and, and you know, people tend to care about them more than they care about the chair in the environment. Um, but, uh, you know, you need a lot of chairs. You need a lot of, you know, so, so you still want to put some detail in that chair, um, but you don't want to push it as much as, as your, you know, a gun, a gun that's in your face, first person shooter, that gun is in your face the entire time. It has a kind of set resolution that it's always at on the screen. So you want to make sure that you put enough, enough detail into the, into the gun if it's a view, view model gun. That you know you can you can see all the little scratches and you can see all those little things because it is in your face. But the coke can on the desk 
isn't in your face. You probably don't need to read the writing on the Coke can. Uh, you, you don't need to, uh, you know, you don't need to see, like I said, the keyboard. Like my model, I've modeled a couple of keyboards in my day, and um, you know, the keyboard is basically. What does this keyboard look like to you guys? Yeah, back back there in the back. Can you see any of the buttons on there? No. No. All right. It, you might like you might catch this one. You know. If you're kind of relatively close, you might catch this little raise in, in detail here. So, so that's probably what I'd do. I'd say, okay, this whole thing is one group. This whole, this button, and then this group of buttons, and then this group of buttons, and this group of buttons. And then it has a little bit of surface detail when you get up close to it, but it's basically just a box. And you can do most of your detail in your normal map. And, and then as you're running over to it, all the light plays on there, and you're like, whoa, that's an awesome keyboard. And then, <laughs> and then you keep shooting somebody in the face. You know? <laughs> so uh, what's, what's up? Yeah, so, so when you're making that, say, like I said, an honest portfolio, what, what would you say five scenes that you would look at? Yeah, what would you be looking I, I think, for? honestly, the ones you rattle off are actually, actually really good. Uh, it, it, I try to look at the scope of the scene. Uh, if, if it's like I said, if it's a if it's a castle scene or something like that, you can you can make some, some you can spend some time making some really cool looking pillars. You can make a really cool looking wall segment, and and then you can sort of use those pillars everywhere. One one trick that um, Epic uh, does with a lot of their modularity. I didn't really talk about modularity. Modularity is a big deal. Um, modularity is you know you. You tiling something, whether that is a texture or a or a model, um, or just repeating objects in the scene. That's kind of considered, you know, a, a form of modularity. Um, but when you make a pillar, uh, if, what Epic likes to do is they make a pillar that looks different on all four sides. So they'll put like these concrete pillars here, you know, if tons of tons of bullets are going towards that, that concrete pillar. You might see some pop marks, boom, boom, boom. Maybe on another side, an explosion went off, and now you see rebar on this corner, and then maybe the other corner didn't get touched very much, and then maybe the other corner uh, got touched a little more and is breaking off. So now you can take that one pillar and rotate it around and run it down walls. You can embed it into walls and then have different detail running down your wall um, you know, you can do the same thing with your wall segments themselves, so that uh, you know you, you make a couple of different wall segments, and now you have a really cool looking castle. You know, I mean, you you just you spend a little time in ZBrush sculpting sculpting a little bit. Um, you know, s spend some time in Max. You know, making making the pieces, making the sci-fi the sci-fi pillar or the part or whatever. Uh, back to back. So, what's your texture resolution for that box? Uh, it is a 1024. Yep, it's a 1024, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that you know you would basically walk up and take take cover on. Um, you know, it, it reads. I think it reads pretty well. Like at uh, you know at this low, you know, here you can start to see pixels. You know, when you're right here on it, but you know how often how often are you going to be here? You know, if you zoom in on your sniper scope right next to it, okay, yeah, it kind of falls apart. Yeah. But, uh, you know. You better be more worried about the guy trying to shoot you. If you're right. Yeah, you can do that, you're about to get stabbed in the back. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, you're dead. You know, it doesn't matter. Look at that new kind of yeah. sniper generator. And you can see that, you know, with, with the buttons, I, I, I kind of did something, uh, I tried to do something cl clever with the buttons here, is I, I recessed the panel. So, since the panel itself is recessed, you never see the silhouette of the buttons. So you don't mind that they're just a texture on this thing. So the only time it really falls apart is if you see it like at this angle, you know, you might you might notice that they're just it's just a texture. But you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. That's why I like I like to keep these things that are that's why I love details that go into the surface because they just read so much better. Um, because they never fall apart. They're always really cool and dug into that surface. So I like to divot in my screws and have those nice, you know what I mean, when a countersunk screw, you know, it, it's, that, it's that thing when, you know, when you have, uh, I grew up as a, a, my dad was a carpenter, so, um, it, it, it's like when you screw something in at a 90 degree angle and you have this kind of like really cool scoop, 
that then goes into the screw, so the screw kind of follows, you know, hosing and wires sort of do that too, so it's a really nice detail to have that kind of stuff. And you can just slap that right on the surface, and then it reads as this really cool scoop in that surface. Yeah. When you're uh, making reel for that, how do you show that off? Um, your demo reel, when you got to do like a wireframe in the reel, you know, no, obviously you don't, you got you don't have to show it off. You don't it, show it off? It looks good. You know, it just it look it looks good in the in the in the big picture. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you, they don't you, really care you, to see a wire of that. Yeah, you you don't you don't need to show someone how exactly you made this thing. Okay. Um, if you want to have a blog or have something you know online to, to share your knowledge with someone, uh, that, that's a great way to, to show that. And, and if somebody, if an employer really wants to go read about what you have to say, then they will. Um, but uh, you know, you, you don't have to put that on a reel or anything. You know, you just you, you want a really nice finished looking piece of game art uh, that you know that somebody somebody they don't really care how you make it. They care they care if you can make it and how much. Time it took you to make it, maybe you know. Uh, back to the back. Um, I just want to ask uh, when I when I do models, I similar to that. If I have problems where the edges, like the corners of it, will be just very sharp and not have a little highlight like yours does. Uh huh. Is that just from the normal map? That's just from the normal map. How did, how did you get that? Is that that's that crazy bump? That crazy bump is. Crazy bump. Yeah. So is there just the shape recognition of crazy bump, I guess? Okay. Um, crazy bump looked at my UVs like a height map. So so I just okay. have outlined UVs and then it just pillows them out. It just pops them out a little bit. I think I understand what happened. Yeah. And so so those those edges are, are blending with each other. Yeah. What about edges that are like inside? So like say like say you sculpted like with a uh, trip dynamic or whatever. Uh huh. And like broken some edges up. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um so the way to sort of get this kind of thing, like let's say you do something like that in ZBrush, it's 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 not a square shape but it's a kind of angular sort of shape. Um, the, the way to get the same sort of effect is to split your smoothing groups. When, when, you, like, when you split a smoothing group, you split an island. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to break off an island away from each other. You have to divide them. Like they can't be right next to each other because then it doesn't know which normal to share. So you break them up, and now it says, oh, I'm by myself, and I'm by myself. I'm not this one, or not this one. And so you'll see those weird artifacts, like when you have, especially have a 90 degree angle uh -huh. on those kinds of things. Uh, so that's how you solve it. Not, honestly, I like learned that a couple of months ago. <laughs> like, and I was like, what? Why don't I know this? I just freaked out and like yelled at my coworker. So you actually will have like a bunch of little chunks. Like if you were to break an edge off. Yes. Like all those little tiny pieces of chunk are separate. Yeah. Items. If you if you split the if you split the smoothing group on your low poly, you split the split the islands. You split the smoothing group. Split the islands. So that's kind of how I try to yeah. remember. Yeah. So every smoothing group. Yeah. I have You haven't got one. That's what we get to see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No problem. Hey, guys. A couple more questions and we gotta let Nick go. He's got. Actually, it's really worth it, so. <laughs> um, my question is like concerning all of the like advanced yeah, motion technology mm -hmm. and like all these yeah. more yeah. techniques, yeah. you know, motion capture for animators, yeah. and all these different types of maps for um, uh, 3D artists, yeah. and then also the uh, this, or, like earlier you talked about like Nerf, for example, like these studios, these small studios working on big AAA titles, and yeah. ne their name necessarily yeah. isn't on the box, but mm -hmm. they're working on these big huge titles. How is that affected? Uh, the industry and and um, like how do, how how does that does that give you more opportunities to do yeah, yeah, artists? Yeah. And also, I want to ask you. Yeah, I saw some of the titles you worked on. You haven't worked with that clown Sean Spitz, have you? Yeah. <laughs> no comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know where. I, I honestly don't know where the industry's heading. It's it's such a new, like this is like one of the newest sort of industries, like out there. I mean, this is like up there with like green energy and stuff like that. It, it's it's very new. games are just very very new and they're constantly changing, constantly evolving. And so it's it's really hard to predict, like. 
the size of the studios, uh, where where mobile games are going to be in in ten years. I mean, you can basically, you know, the best thing to do is just look at the top of the line thing right now and then say, okay, that's probably going to be my bar in five years. I got to match that. I got to figure out how to match that as early as I can, so that when when a producer comes up to me and says, hey, I need that thing tomorrow, I'm like. Uh, okay, you know, like if you know if you don't know how to make that thing when they come up to you, you know, <laughs> you're you're kind of screwed. Or at least you could say, no, 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 I know how long that thing's gonna take. It's gonna take me, you know, two or three days, and not one day like you think it's gonna take. So, so I just you know, it, it, it's such a it's such a hard thing to, to to estimate. I hope that I see more things like the Unity Asset Store. I'll get you one more. I'll get this. Put your hand down. Okay. I hope to think, see things more like the Unity Asset Store uh, in the future because because I think that that's where movie studios like that's that's what we're not doing that movie studios have done for years. I mean, the, the production company literally just goes next door. I don't know if you've ever taken a tour to back um, studios back lot or something like that. Always. Always try to do it if you're in LA or, or um, you know, even Disney World like does a little, they do a little backlot tour if you ever go to, go to Disney World. Um, but you can look in those prop rooms. They basically look like a big junk store. They look like something off of, uh, you know, junkyard wars or, or uh, you know, storage wars or something. It, it's like shelves of just crap just thrown on the, you know, thrown in these these shelves. But but a, a director or, or a set designer, more, more or so, who walks around the store and says, mm, I want that, and I want that, and I want that, and I want that, and, want that. and then they put them in their sci-fi environment, and now it's, you know, now it's, it has life, you know, it has real, real things. And so I think that, that our industry might head that way in, in the sense that there might be stores out there. I mean, there already are stores out there. There's already, you know, uh, uh, Turbo Squid, uh, which, you know, s some people might know about. But that Unity Asset Store is really cool for games because everything's kind of like already there, already ready and implemented, you know, unlike uh, Turbo Squid. Which you know, architecture firms use Turbo Squid a lot. Um, uh, sometimes I've heard movie studios or commercials, like people that make commercials, might use Turbo Squid for things like that. But you know, those things aren't really ready for games. You know, they're you, you still have a, you still have a process to take those things. And, and those and those details, like I was showing you guys with the boxes, how they disappear on the normal map. Uh, a lot of those Turbo Squid models, they don't take normal maps into consideration. They're just modeling the thing that they see. You know, they model they model an eraser and it's like, it's square. That's, that's how I modeled it. Like, that's what it looks like. You know, and, and you know, they put a, a really crazy, you know, shader or something in, in film and ray traced and everything else on everything. And you can't, you don't see that it's a crude model. Um, I think you'd be surprised at how, how bad <laughs> some film, some film models are out there because they have the power of the renderer to make them look soft and make them look.